Happy February, everyone, and welcome to the Customer Success Leadership Roundtable. Can you guys hear me all right? My audio okay? Yeah? All right. Well, I can hear you. Good. Uh, uh, my name is Andrew Marks. I'm the co-founder and architect of the Success Coaching Training Program. We are back for our monthly live webcast today talking about incorporating partners into your customer success strategy. This free learning event is brought to you by Success Coaching, the world leader in customer success professional development training with more than 22,000 students globally on our skills development platform. Our programs are available in a variety of formats from self-paced online learning to virtual instructor-led boot camps. We still have some space in our spring 12-week CCSM executive education program that's delivered in conjunction with the University of San Francisco School of Management. That's where we we uh, we go through our, our level one and level two program on a weekly basis, consuming content, and then you get to meet with me, and and we have uh, we have a a coaching call once a week. That program launches next week, and I think we still have a two hundred fifty dollar off coupon available as long as you register by this Friday. And uh, uh, we're also getting ready to launch a major refresh to our level one program by the end of the month. So if you've been holding off um, on checking out our content, this would be the time to jump on board. Ashley will drop a link into our um, a link to our program page and any coupons that we're offering right now uh, in chat. And you can find out more about our online learning and instructor led programs and workshops at successcoaching.co. Uh, for those of you who haven't participated in one of these events before, this is a live and unscripted discussion where we dig into a single topic relevant to customer success leadership. Regardless of the company that you work for, the scope of your role, or the size of the customers that your teams deal with, we aim to pick topics that are going to be practical and useful to you. The schedule for our upcoming events can also be found at successcoaching.co. Click on the events tab at the top of the page and uh, and uh, to uh, find out more. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Ashley? A few housekeeping items before we get started. Thank you. <laughs> this webinar is recorded and we'll be posting a replay along with a transcript on our website early next week. We will be taking questions later on during the webinar. So please don't be shy and use that, that uh, I think it's right about here, that Q&A button found at the bottom of your screen to ask your own question or upvote one that you see on there that's already there. We're also broadcasting on LinkedIn Live and have somebody monitoring that feed. Thank you, Tracy. If you have questions, please post them and they'll be relayed to us. Also, please keep all commentary, comments about what people are saying, things like that, to the chat window and then questions to the Q&A window. Now, there's a lot of thought leadership out there along with a lot of uh, theories about how to deliver customer success. In this series, we focus on the practical real-world advice, best practices, techniques, and shared experiences from those working with or leading customer success teams on a daily basis. And to do that, we invite three panelists to join me for a roundtable discussion. These are people who are great at their craft, and we ask them to share their experiences and their perspectives. So without further ado, I'd like our panelists to introduce themselves to uh, you all, talk a bit about who they are and what they do, and let's get started as usual in alphabetical order with Cynthia. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yep, I'm Cynthia Silva, I'm based in New York City. I work at NASDAQ, um, help launch our customer sec success initiative um, for the market technology division. A lot of people ask that. How is an exchange a SaaS company? That's how. <laughs> we, have a, we have a SaaS product for anti-financial crime. Um, the bulk of my career has been in client-facing roles, starting on trading desks, and producing international events, and most recently in the fintech space. Um, you know, I've covered regions, lived and worked in the U.S., EMEA, and LATAM, and so I've had the opportunity to work with external external partners uh, and help clients vet third-party partners uh, as part of their expansion plans. So um, I'm psyched for this conversation. That's me. On to you, Eric. Awesome. Thanks, Cynthia. Eric, yep, you're up. Yep. Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks, Andrew. Hey, my name is Eric Douglas. I'm the Senior Manager of Customer Success. I currently work for FinThrive, a SaaS-based healthcare technology company. We provide revenue management technology solutions to healthcare providers across the U.S. Uh, I've served in client-facing roles as a leader in various industries for 15 years. So uh, from SaaS to pharmaceutical to revenue management and also, also uh, uh, 
hospitals as well. So I've been around the block a few times as a client <laughs> success professional. I look forward to learning from the panel and also sharing my experience. So that is me in a nutshell. Turn over to you, Lorenzo. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. Lorenzo, you're up. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. And good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Lorenzo Serva. I manage a team of customer success managers, and, and we cover the Asia Pacific region with a focus on ASEAN, so um, ASEAN, China, and Japan. Personally, I've been in customer success for about 10 years, uh, originally in Europe. I'm originally from Italy, so I did work there for a while, and I spent the last few years of my life in, in Australia. So I'm currently based in Sydney, and I'm working for a company called Dynatrace. It's an American-listed company um, bringing to market a cloud observability and security platform with a focus on large uh, B2B transactions. The US entity has been around for about seven years in customer success. APAC, we started a bit uh, later, it's about four years now. And so uh, that's our local experience. In this region, we got a large variety of um, time zones and languages. We got about time zones and some 20 languages. And so we use partners extensively because this is a very complex and multi-level market. So Lorenzo, you're a day ahead of us all. So what's happened? What's going to happen? What do we have to, what do we have to look forward to tomorrow? <laughs> I'm telling you, you walk into an amazing day. <laughs> I won't spoil it. It's awesome. It's going to be good. You are that much closer to your weekend than we are. I'm impressed. <laughs> You're nearly a day closer to your weekend. So that's so awesome. So jealous. Yeah, totally jealous. Good for you. Uh, once again, we all appreciate the time that you're that you're spending us uh, with us uh, with us today. Uh, now let's get to uh, the topic at hand. Partners play an important role in helping organizations reach potential customers, uh, boost sales, and increase profits. By leveraging their networks and resources, companies can access new markets while gaining additional expertise and support in their operations. They provide a cost-effective way to expand into new regions without the need for direct investments or taking on risky business ventures. I've been part of many companies where we've leveraged uh, that strategy uh, without having to set up operations. It's a, it's, a, it's a very sound approach. Through partners, organizations can also benefit from increased market exposure, which in turn leads to increased sales and greater brand recognition. Partners can also provide access to both technology or technical skills and knowledge that might otherwise be unavailable within an organization. This extra support ensures ongoing success by providing additional know-how and resources that help organizations grow and evolve over time. So ultimately, partners allow businesses to access bigger markets, gain necessary expertise, and increase profitability, making them valuable for growth strategy. But you don't just flip a switch and have a partner program. Right? There are some strategies and best practices that go into rolling something like this out, which I'd like to discuss in more detail today. So to get us started though, what elements of their business should I be looking at when I'm selecting a partner? Yeah, look, I'll take this one just to kick us off. Uh, reflecting on the way that we did it, I reckon at the highest level, there's two things that you really want to keep in mind. One is the importance of the commercial fit between the way you sell and the market sells or on sales. And the other one is the, um, the, the way that your technology uh, complements or interacts with whatever they bring to market. You need really to get together and have a shared vision of what needs to happen, how you can work together, and how you're going to create value for your end customers long term. And that takes a couple of, of formats in general. Uh, one way would be when you are leveraging the partner to open up new markets, and so you let the partner take the lead and you sit on the back seat and you specialize in whatever your offering is, or the partner might be a bit of a light touch one where all it does um, for your organization is that they will introduce you within certain uh, business circles or relationships, but you are really running whatever you do in a extended manner. And specifically to customer success, you need to be clear about once you land the first deal, once you close the first piece of business, what's gonna happen next. Because in SaaS, we know that most of the time we tend to lend quickly and relatively small. And the real value creation is the long-term expansion, is the long-term collaboration with customers. And, and partners can be very instrumental there as long as you are 
clear about who's going to do what, do where do we overlap in terms of offering, and who's going to take care of certain specific aspects that might be uh, very unique to that relationship or very unique to that country, like we do when we deal with certain governments and the likes. Very important to be clear about these sort of uh, practicalities, because otherwise the relationship unravels fast. So basically, what you're, I mean, what you, what you, what you basically are saying is, we got to make sure we're aligned. Right. Yeah, got yeah, be, yeah. There's got to be yeah. some some alignment. What what are our, aligning our now? And what are their objectives? And All for right. the long for the long term, so you know what what you're actually working towards. Otherwise, it's it's be hard to decide what to do next if you don't have a view. Right, that makes sense. Cynthia. Yeah, Lorenzo. You know, you had so many good points. I loved I loved your kind of recap on that going out the door with that. But that's what I I I kind of latched onto was. The alignment, because you're right. From from the front side, you need to make sure that that there is you have the same vision and how to execute. And then I also think like the alignment in the long term strategy as well, because I think that um you know where things can go wrong is if you set it and forget it and you don't really know what's happening. Um, I think you have to put these um uh strategic partners in a cadence. You know where I don't know if it's like monthly, quarterly, by you know some annual, whatever it might be, um to to kind of um not not because we don't like check in in uh, in customer success, right? No, we don't. We don't, check in. We don't like. Check we don't check in. <laughs> no. We we have very very specific points we want to um we want to review, and it could be things of you know like things to to just like new releases, new new product enhancements, things of that sort. Uh, you know, new training, um, you know, specifications and things of that sort. But that's I think that that where things can go off the rails is if you do a set it and forget it strategy. That that continued long term vision alignment and be a contact and those cadences, I think would be a big help and have been. Well, I think it's important. You also both touched on this is, is establishing, you know, you need to establish some clear roles, right? So once, once we, once we've, we've, we've determined that we've got a partner organization that uh, aligns well with what we're trying to achieve, we need to make sure that we've established some clear roles. We have some, some, uh, uh, some rules of engagement, yeah. Uh, that uh, that have been have been set up. I mean, once again, this isn't just something where you say, "Hey, I want a partner program." Right? I mean, that's yeah, that's a good that's a good starting point. But there's there's a lot to unpack when you say, "I want a partner program." Yeah, and yeah. I, I would agree on that. The alignment piece is most definitely key, right? It can it can make you or break you in terms of you know aligning with your goals and your values of your organization and, and that partner. You, you, the both of you have to share and align with your goals, and has to be the approach has to be similar to that of you as a customer. I had an example where we had a partner agreement, um, but then you know our customer is coming back to us saying, "Hey, this partner is actually also trying to trying to vet out other vendors for us to go to, and we actually do the same have the same product and same solutions, right?" And so. Throughout the vetting process of us picking that partner, you know, we might have missed a step there because for us to have an agreement, but then you to go out and poach um, our, our joint customers and try to sell them on a different uh, uh, vendor to, to a different vendor. Well, that that breaks trust, that breaks the agreement. And so and it also destroys reputation on both parties. So, yeah, you most definitely have to be aligned. Well, that sounds like a situation where somebody on, on in your partner organization was was asleep at the wheel, not putting some sort yeah. of 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 uh, uh, you know set, setting expectations. If if uh, yeah. those were expectations that you had, uh, yeah. that this would be you know that you you, you know we, we don't want to be part of a of, of a group of people that we're we're competing against. Well, I mean that's yeah. not the value of having a partner. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And it had us thinking that we were a partner you know, throughout the organization, but we're not, we're not, you know, their, their preferred vendor choice, but we thought we were. So yeah, to your point, it was, it, it was a bad partnership. So. Now, was that because there was once again, somebody from your partner organization that was asleep at the wheel that, uh, or was that because, you know, that, that you actually had it in your contract, but that the partner was going ahead and, and acting that way and basically going against what you had agreed to? Someone was asleep at the wheel. And I think that, you know, over time, the partnership may have eroded a little bit and then mm -hmm. contracts got re redone. And then so, you know, throughout the negotiation of the contracts and talking through the contract, several pieces were probably missed. Right. Um, but then it just didn't, 
it didn't go well, you know, for our organization because we thought we were a partner, but then it was clearly not a partnership. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. So we talked about alignment. Uh, I think it also goes without saying that we want, we want partners that have relevant experience, right? I mean, what's the point of bringing somebody in if they don't bring relevant experience? What about, um, what 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 are what other elements uh, do you think are important uh, when it comes to selecting uh, selecting a partner? Uh, I think the key here is to understand that not all partners are created equal, hmm. and so uh, you need to have some sort of a vetting process in place. And usually, yep. something understanding what the partner brings to market. And again, I've got a similar experience to Eric, where we started with a partner that we thought had a certain remit, which was your traditional implementation and onboarding, or implementation, really. We do onboarding ourselves. We've got a methodology in customer success that's successful. So we just wanted a partner to um, to, to implement for us. It was another language, another geo, so it would just make total sense um, to implement, to imp- imp- have a partner doing that legwork, which they did. But then the customer, without us being aware, started asking questions that were well and truly behind the original scope. Questions like, oh, so now that we've got this uh, solution here, which happened to be our solution, we want to execute on this other piece of strategy that might require a different platform. Now, that extension work is something that we could have had something about if we knew about it. The partner never got back to us. They went on and put forward like a bake-off, uh, like-for-like comparison type of exercise. And by the time, I found out it was already late because I didn't have a chance to influence the decision-making process for this second um, initiative. And then I had to patch our relevance back into that conversation. So I went back to the partner and said, I think this is not the ground on which we should be operating together. We missed a big piece around understanding each other offering and we didn't spell out the long-term value creation for the customer and for ourselves in the relationship. And so we went back to our customer, um, our partner, rather, organization, and now we got a bit of a matrix where we have strategic partners that we know that we can operate and they have capability for extending the conversation. We got partners that are like meetings. We got partners that are just implementation partners all the way down to partners that are just, um, well, you could call them paper shufflers. They, you need to transact through them because they are a procurement vehicle for certain type of business, but you know where they stand. And uh, mapping those out, and sometimes for us means having a partner that takes care of the procurement at this level, then you've got an implementation partner, but the big conversation happens with a master partner or a main partner where you are mapping out strategy for the customer, you're mapping out your customer success strategy. And really there's not much sense in try and build a customer success model with your low level partners, because there's not the, there's not the playground. There's not what to do. You need to make sure that you, like you do with customer, you make sure that you're delivering the right content at the right level of seniority in the organization. And you do the same with, within your partner ecosystem. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, there are different types of partners. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I've put them in my career, I've put them into, into four different buckets, right? You've got your, your, your VARs, your channel partners, right? These are your value-added resellers. They're coming in with some expertise. They're coming in with, with uh, with ex- uh, with with uh, relationships, yeah, uh, you know, which is key, uh, and um, and so you so you get your vars, and they're almost I found the vars to be kind of the full service, right? You're gonna you're gonna own um, the relationship, you're gonna own closing the deal, uh, you're likely gonna own the implementation uh, to an extent, uh, even if it's in a program management role, and we provide resources to to do the onboarding, what have you. Uh, then you've got your uh, you've got your implementation or or onboarding partners, right? So uh, these are people that, as you mentioned, Lorenzo, these are people that you would bring in to help implement a solution. I've also had VARs that started out as implementation partners that worked under my organization until they got there, especially for more technical, technically challenging uh, types of solutions, and you wanted them, you wanted to have some oversight. Uh, on on what they were doing so that they could build up their skills, their expertise. Because at the end of the day, um, the customer is looking at your logo, right? And and so their experience, and this is why cus- I think cu- training them in customer success is also super important. Their experience is based on your logo, not your partner. You're not your partner's logo. Uh, then then you have uh, potentially some enablement partners. 
So, you know, maybe they're not doing implementation, but they're doing training. I see those less frequently because typically there's some sort of enablement. Uh, and then you've got technology partners, right? So those are where you have um, uh, you have partners where either you're embedding their technology in your in in what you're offering, or or they're embedding your technology in what they're offering. I've worked in in both those uh, those roles. So the the you know analyzing the different qualities. Uh, uh, of partners uh, are going to be different for each of the different types of partners. But we, we, I've always used when I'm, and, and I've worked with partners for, for a long time. I've always used this kind of acronym called, uh, called ERA. Uh, it's, it's, it's experience. So relevant experience. So the experience, make sure they have the industry knowledge that, that we're looking for uh, um, reputation, right? So they have a good reputation and sometimes that reputation can change as you begin to, it's not just the reputation you hear before you bring them on board, but the reputation they get as they continue to to do business with you. Reliability also one of those things where you gotta you gotta make a call out. You know how reliable are they, and and that can wane over time. I've I've had that experience uh, as well. Uh, resources do, do, does the does the partner have the resources to be able to do what needs to be done, regardless of the type of partner they are. Uh, and then back to wh what you kicked off with, Re Re Lorenzo. Uh, uh, the the alignment piece, right? How 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 uh, are, are do we have a partner that's 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 well aligned with what we're trying to do? Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, uh, yeah. Uh, the way that look like. Look, first of all, yes, we do this. We got a similar model in place. We got um, VAR, so value adding resellers, and the departments, the lead relationships, and the like. Where we struggle is we've got another category of partners that we call MSPs, managed service providers. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they buy our product, then they buy another 20 products and they lump it all together. For example, uh, one of the main features of our product is artificial intelligence. And so we got partners that brought to market a artificial intelligence uh, ready made business suit for whatever business. The customer doesn't even know that my Dynatrace product is in the mix. So they just buy this artificial intelligence um, engine that does a bunch of things for them. I have very little leverage to then go to the end customer and talk about what else we do. Because the master part, the, the, uh, the MSP would say, we don't really want to know about it. You, we selected some features, we assemble with something else. It's like you bring these Lego bricks, we build this house and that's what we sell. We sell the house and you bring a couple of Lego bricks. That's it. So that is a bit of a struggle uh, in, in general. Um, but it's uh, a good way to get visibility of a custom ecosystem. And, you know, by the time the customer is selecting you for some capability, it is like there's some overlaps with the other capability. So the conversation turns to the customer and say, okay, now at this point, you have decided to use features A, B, and C. Are you aware that there's other features there and they would unlock a lot of value for you in terms of additional implementation, additional support and whatever, and for the customer? Because we're pushing the solution forward. Otherwise, you see where your solution that you assemble is going to be going out of market quickly. Someone mm -hmm. else will do it better. And you need to operate at the edge of you know, innovation. And that's what we can do for you. You keep on packaging, but you're always packaging you know, at the leading edge. And that's usually a conversation that goes down well. Um, also, another thing about uh, the difference between implementation and onboarding that I mentioned before. So the way we do it, uh, we think as uh, implementation as a uh, subset of your total onboarding. So we don't mind having a partner that does the implementation where implementation has got to do with the um, technical requirements gathering, a bit of um, legwork, the, conf the technical configuration of the platform, any code that needs to be written off and the likes. What we want to retain is the onboarding experience that includes that plus includes the uh, kickoff, the value realization, the executive engagement includes the training that could follow up, include the ongoing um, um, monitoring of adoption. These are the sort of things that belong to our, our customer success program, and we will not go away. Um, we will not outsource them to a partner. Yeah. So you own you own adoption. Yeah, well, yes, because we think it's part of the long term, long term success strategy. Implementation is more transactional, so it's okay to outsource. The adoption is something that uh, we, you know, we live and we die by. So yes, it has to be with us. Cynthia, Eric, do you do you both own, or have you been in situations where you've you've either 
you know, had that type of implementation part of their own adoption or didn't own it at all? And the partner was responsible for all of that? Well, I think that's actually a really good question because I think that um, that it can go either way. I don't think it matters. And I've been in I've been in both situations, but I think where it succeeded is where you, again you you it's, it goes, just goes back to the alignment because again, if you leave it to them to help with the adoption, then how are they how are they really doing that? You know what I mean? And I think a lot of times you don't know until things start to go wrong if you're not you know consistently you know getting on the same page and ensuring that that the activities are actually moving everything forward and, and kind of going back to like with, with one of the things, cause um, you know, it's just, this just made me think of something else in terms of how do you select a partner? This also, you know, one of the things I think that we need to make sure is that, that whatever partner you choose understands and is dialed into your industry or sector. And then in terms of like region, um, I know, cause I, I covered LATAM and especially for these sort of partner situations and it's heavily relationship based. So if who you pick doesn't have, first of all, doesn't understand your sector, then that's obviously a bad choice. But if they don't have the relationships, then it's really, it's, you might as well just do it yourself from exactly. a different country. Right. Okay. Um, and, and so then that goes into like, you know, the, you know, it, understanding that and then how do you um you know dip, uh, put together the compensation structure so that they are incentivized and, and excited about pushing that through and the answer to that is it depends which is a you know i know our standard response but it does really i would think when you're trying to when you're leveraging partners going into specific, you know regions that you're not familiar with yeah. that you're not comfortable with that you you would not be doing it justice if you didn't put a program in place that enabled them to drive adoption themselves, right? Mm -hmm. They, I would think that they would be in a much better position to drive that adoption, to, to, to own the customer, right. Mm -hmm. From, from, from start to finish. Yeah. And that's a lot of trust too, right? You have to have a lot of trust, but you're right. If you do get that right partner and they do feel like they're, they're representing the, their logo as them, you know, as themselves, right. You really need them to be bought in. Um, then, then that's where that it could really be the most fruitful partnerships. And, and those are the ones that I think have worked the best in the past. Well, I think it's not just trust too. I think you need to have, you need to be, you need to educate them. Yeah. We, we a couple of our largest customers have now mandated that their partners go through uh, the first couple levels of our training program on customer success, just so they get exposed to the concepts of customer. Right, that it's so important to them, and I'm and I'm talking really large, without mentioning names, I'm talking really large global organizations that have basically said, for you to achieve different levels of certification in our partner program, you need to consume, you need to be exposed to customer success concepts. Right, we want you to take the same training programs that our own internal customer success teams are taking. That's how important it is. You know, and, and so I think that, I think that it's, it's, it's goes beyond just uh, trust, but actually enabling them to be able to do that sort of thing. Yeah. And it's, uh, we also do that as well. Andrew is that we provide training and support. We put them through the same type of training regimen reg that we would do customer success or any other partner we have they go through, they understand the solution, the product, our, what our values are, what our base is, and then what we're trying to accomplish as, as, a, as, a, as a company. So to your point early, it's very, very critical to put your partners through that type of training and provide them with support as if they were your customer and they are your customer, but just making sure you have that training, you have the support, and that's how you establish a good partnership. Because once they have some, some skin in the game in terms of going through the, the training and going through the, the process and the hours and understanding the business, I think you have a long-lasting relationship just going through the process, right? You build relationships, you build confidence. And so when you guys go out together um, to help each other out, uh, then I think it's more of a collaborate, collaborative effort because you guys are on the same page. So uh, same here, Andrew, as far as you know, making them go through a, a, a training um, and also support them throughout the training process. Yeah, I use that term skin in the game. And and what, it's interesting because uh, um, it, it, there is skin in the game required. And mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the battles that I used to have with my partner organizations was uh, uh, they, they wanted to give our partners the training for free. And, and I told them that that was foolish. It, it be, because, you know, you, 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 you mitigate the value when you give it to them for free. And so uh, while, while we were more than happy to, to do some discounting, 
we mandated that every partner needed to pay for their people to go through training. Mm -hmm. Because if you pay for your training, you're going to take it seriously. Right. It's, it's not something that you do give away for free. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I still stand behind that. We even did at one point, one of my, one of my roles, we, we did a little AB test and I said, okay, you guys don't believe me. Let's, let's put this group of people, we're going to put these partners through training and they're going to take it for free. And we're going to put this group through training and they're going to pay for it. And what happened? The people who paid for it took it seriously, mm -hmm. were engaged. And, and we're talking some pretty intense training. We were talking about uh, this, this was a, 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 a platform. Uh, it was a, a, a BI platform. So analytics, business intelligence, building data warehouses, ETL development, that, that whole, the whole nine yards. And the people who paid, the, the partners that paid took it seriously and ended up being more successful uh, as partners with our product than the people who didn't pay who stepped out to do take calls and yada, 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 you know? So I think that's, that's, uh, that, that's pretty important. Uh, that's a, a pretty important element is uh, this, this notion of, of getting skin in the game. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry. Go ahead, try, I was going to say we, the way we try to do it is that um, there's two things. First of all, if partners are certified to a higher level in our program, they retire better margin. So there's a financial incentive there. It's just not a nice to have, depending on, no, the way we measure commitment is this, we pay you more because you know more and we assume that you will be delivering a better customer outcome. So that's, um, that's the transaction side of things. But um, I, I'm always telling my team, when you work with your partners, they, I mean, they work with a bunch of vendors. So we're not even a leading vendors. We're not, you know, our product is very specific, right? So we fulfill certain dedicated use cases. Growing, growing in importance, but at this point, we're one of many. So what can we give the partners that no one else does and will capture the attention? And it comes down to uh, visibility into how the end customer is using uh, the ecosystem in a way the partner we're not aware of. And so we share our telemetry data. And we say, well, team A is where you landed with this solution. And now it looks like our solution is being used by team B. And by analogy, it looks like the team B you're not doing business with might have a similar use case. Why don't we chase this together? Because I don't know anyone there, but you do. But I'm telling you, they seem to be interested in something that we should definitely look uh, forward for. Uh, and usually partners like, oh, I didn't get to that level of depth. It's not something that we do. I don't have time. I don't have the skills. And, and we have the, you know, we've got the telemetry. We've got the solution in place. Uh, that's how we built our customer success program, really. And so it's just not about telling them about the theory of the customer success, but we try and give them insights, uh, reports on number of uses, on number of features, on potential threats in the environment, whatever we think is relevant. That's how we we win the hearts and the minds of our partners by giving them insights. Like again, like Steve, we're customers. That's the value for the partner. I love that. I love that strategy. I love that. That's that. Let's win together, right? Let's win together. It's not just about hey, what are you? What deals are you bringing me into? It's hey, we've got this intelligence that we're going to uh, that, that we 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 want to help you with. We want you to leverage uh, your your contacts. Uh, I love that. Hey, so let's. Uh, why don't we? Um, why don't we get to some of these questions? We got some some questions in here that I think are uh, can can probably take on a life of their own. Uh, <laughs> with some of the answers. So, um, uh, once again, if you have questions, go ahead and um, uh, use that Q and A functionality at the bottom, and we'll uh, we'll get them answered for you. A Emily asks, uh, "I'd love to know about incentives, Lorenzo. You were just talking about incentives. What incentives work well?" Best practices for measuring and monitoring those incentives. How do you ensure the right behavior for partners that are performing customer success motions? Um, I know that uh, that 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 we we used to have uh, different levels of of partnership based off of how people how how much they were certified, right? And and the higher the level of partnership you received, you get a bigger you get a bigger discount, right? So you had you had you make more margin on the deal, of course. Uh, we we also for um, earlier stage partners that were newer to the program, we insisted on uh, because we had a, a a highly technical product. We insisted on being involved. Uh, you know, you, you must contract a certain number of hours for this size of deal to one of our technical architects that would is going to review everything that you're doing because once again, at the end of the day, the customer seeing our logo 
And if they're not happy, they're going to stop doing business with us, not necessarily going to stop doing business with you, right? And you're also in a position where you can throw us under the bus if you really want to. Uh, and 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 we can't do anything about it. Uh, so so that those were some of the you know we 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 incentivize them through through di- through discounts uh, through uh, uh, you know by, by um, performing better uh, they basically increase their margins they didn't have to depend on us uh, as much uh, and, as well as the better they performed the more likely we were to in, in, introduce them into. Uh, into deals. Uh, you know, part of our strategy was was not building a huge internal team to do onboarding. We wanted to leverage uh, our partners and have 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 our internal team be more specialist uh, on the product. Uh, what what have you all uh, seen as good um, levers to to incentivize uh, partners? Well, I mean, I think it, that that's actually a really good question because I think it's it's so tricky, right? I, I was in a situation in the past where we had a partner and they we had a kind of a basket of products, and it, and it, it was a, they were all related products, but they, they were complex. And so what what happened was, you know, like as as you do, you can train people, which we did, but um, the the lowest hanging fruit was the one that they went to because it was easiest, right? It was the easiest to explain. It was et cetera, et cetera. And so the way we turned that around was to say, okay, um, well, we we had different you know insights that we thought like, you know, as kind of touching on what Lorenzo was saying was just like, hey, we know that this type of, uh, uh, you know, prospect might be right, you know, let's share those insights, figure out ways that you can leverage specific solutions, again, with additional training to kind of align more and get them to not just focus on the low hanging fruit, but kind of we wanted them to, to try to push everything when it was appropriate, of course. So that really did help. Sure. Lorenzo, Eric, what do, what do you got? What do you got on this? one? I think on, on my end, well, we, what are my experiences? It starts off with the agreement, um, uh, understanding and different levers within the agreement of quarterly incentives um, and with an overall effort to, to reduce churn, to, to make sure the, cl- the client is satisfied. So we incentivize our our partners through their agreement, whether it's monetary or you know uh, discounts and revenue. So we incentivize them throughout the contract. So if the if the customer is happy, they're incentivized for their happiness and, and included um, in that agreement uh, that we have with our partner. So that's yeah, that's customer one way satisfaction that I've seen ratings. It. That was definitely part of ours as well. You you couldn't hit you couldn't reach additional higher levels unless you had a common, you had a successful certain number of successful implementations and a certain level of customer sat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We had to be not, it wasn't just about implementing, it wasn't just about onboarding, but were the customers happy with what they got? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like off. Fran, yeah. Fran dropped something into the chat. Speaking at executive summits is an incentive, right? I think yeah. that's, that's also a great incentive. Speaking at user group meetings. Hey, if you are doing, if you're a value partner of ours, we're going to put you up in front of all of our users in, in or in front of an executive summit or a, a special, you know, uh, uh, maybe we do a, a customer roundtable and we're going to have you present something. And that's going to give you exposure to, you know, existing customers or potentially prospects. Always a nice incentive. Lorenzo, you got anything to add on incentives? Uh, look, the way we do it is that we measure partners on a bunch of um directions. The first one is, as you'd said, the level of certification, which is a bit gameable because if you're a large partner, you get your graduates certified in all technologies, and then the consultant rocks up to customer might or might not have heard about us specifically, so I'm not a big fan. Number of clear, uh, close deals and satisfaction is a big one for us. And the other one is the frequency because our product uh, keeps on changing quite significantly. It's very new technology, so we want to have partners that have been uh, working with us lately. So they up to date with the latest, they've got better success stories, they've got better use cases, they can reference customers that are current and then the news. Uh, and that makes all the difference. And that's why, you know, usually as a, as a partner, you make to one of our events as a speaker exactly because of that. Because we want you to share with others how great's been the latest thing that you've done. And we think that the market wants to hear about it because it's relevant, because it's timely. Right. right. Yeah. And once again, win win. Right, you're. Mm. We've got somebody besides a talking head from our company that's talking about the value that they see out in the market for your for for the solution, and you're getting exposed to somebody who knows how to implement these solutions. 
business that comes to the table with maybe not just that subject matter expertise, but product expertise. Uh, and as as a as a, a while while you're a partner, you're still an independent third party. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And in addition to that, if if that person has like um you know has a strong brand, that that's a great win, right? Yeah. Because you want to put them, you know, have them be part of your community events and speaking engagements and things of that sort, or, or feature them in, in some way to kind of get that local exposure. That's like that's like an un, um, intangible element of of kind of promoting your brand in a positive way. Oh yeah. It was always tremendous. In the companies I worked, some of the larger companies I worked with, uh, like uh, like the Scopus uh, uh, SAP business objects, uh, we we you got a partner like an Accenture or or a Bearing Point or Deloitte that's that's doing a presentation at one of your user group summits uh, about how you know they were able to leverage our technology in solving this particular problem for this global brand. It's, Awesome, Emily, thank you for the question. A uh, next question comes from Kimberly. Kimberly asks, what sort of structures do you put in place to create and maintain alignment? Uh, for example, success plans, partnership contracts, periodic reviews. I think the partnership contract is super important. Um, uh, I definitely think success plans, personally, these, these days need to be something that is jointly built with a partner. Uh, you know, and, and, and this is part of that, educating them on the... Um, on, on the importance of uh, the of customer success and, and and some of the key elements of of customer success, so they have that customer success mindset. It's not about sales, 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 right? You've got to have the in in the subscription economy. Everybody needs to embrace the 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 customer success mindset because we're playing a long game. Whether yeah. you are a vendor or you're a partner to a vendor, right? Yep. You know, I think that's a great question too, because or um, from Kimberly, because you know, like success plans, we can treat these client these partners like we would our own clients, oh. right? We want to work with you together. We have these plans. We're doing those those you know monthly, quarterly, you know semi-annually, you know contact, um, you know contact or, or interactions um, to kind of keep each other honest and and on pace for the the desired business outcomes, right? That's all about CS. Yeah. And that's why I think it's important that you, you, it's not, they're not just in some of these partners that I met, some of these customers that I, I mentioned before that are, that are putting their partners through our program. It's not just our program. They're using our program to provide them with the fundamentals, but they're also teaching them, you know, they're also providing that connective tissue between the basics, you know, the foundational elements of customer success that we teach and then what that means in their world, right? To, to sell and implement and, and drive adoption within within their customer base. Uh, so, yeah, that's, you know, that's so, a good one, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, we also do like, you know, every year, every twice a year, we do like uh, account reviews where we go through a list of age and every customer, right? And understand their success plans and strategize and, you know, what what are we looking for? How are we gonna expand that, expand that relationship? We do the same thing for our, our partners. We do success planning. We do annual account reviews to make sure we are all in alignment. There's if there's anything we can do to kind of expand that relationship as well. So to Cynthia's point, yes, we're going to treat our partners the same way we would uh, a customer. So uh, that's a great point, Cynthia. I wanted to kind of point well, that an, out. There's an extent we need to be thinking about them as an extension, right? They're an extension yeah. to our sales team and they're an extension to our post sales team. That's you know if that if that's how you're using partner, let's just assume. These are MSPs or they're VARs and they're doing the selling and they're doing the, and they're doing the onboarding. We need to treat them as extensions, not just this kind of separate thing that says, okay, sell stuff and then send us, send us the revenue. Right. Yeah. The risk that might be there and back to Eric's point is that sometimes partner think that they sell uh, the deal in year one. And there's going to be a rent that they will retire forever. So the way uh, no, we've done in other industries is like when you are in part of the mortgage broking industry, you make a big commission up front for year one and a much, much smaller commission for any subsequent years, your trading commission. And that's a way that I've seen partners being managed. Now, I won't go into the commercial, my current um, um, system, but I've seen this happening. So a partner is very much incentivized to sell this year. And then they get a little royalty on whatever comes next, or they keep on getting the better cut of the commission if they expand the account. But if the account lands at 100K and it stays at 100K, the relative incentive for the partner decreases over time because that's not aligned with our lend and expand module. It, then that partnership turns into a one-off transactional 
relationship right. and we're not really running customer success. So important to align that incentive model to the long-term commercial and success goals. Yeah. I mean, back in the day before the subscription economy, the that that model worked. I want you to land this deal and we're going to implement it. And then you can go away because we're going to, you know, pull 20, 22% maintenance out of these, out of this company as long as we can. Right. But it's not that it's, it doesn't work that way anymore. Right. The way that we, the way that we deliver our solutions now, whether they're software, or they're something else, it's just, it, everything's going to a subscription. Right. So we're playing a long game. And that means that our incentives need to align with the way in which we're delivering the solution. And there's a lot of companies out there that haven't caught up with that. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, next question from Mohammed. Mohammed asks, uh, what sort of access do you provide to partners to analyze customer your customer health index? So their customer health. So Lorenzo, you were you were mentioning how you were exposing some, you know, you were you were uh, exposing some data that you were harvesting uh, to uh, give um, uh, partners uh, some some uh, uh, some telemetry about where potential additional um, additional opportunities lie. What about just standard customer health? You know, do you do you expose that to them, or is that something that uh, I, I know? In your case, your customer success team uh, owns the partner after it's been implemented. Correct? Yeah, uh, we got uh, we got a multi level uh, customer health module. So there's about twenty factors that go into it. Not all of them are relevant for the partner. So we would extrapolate the ones that are relevant and they got to do with uh, your straight utilization, the frequency of access, the um, number of tickets or whatever interactions you have with support, the sort of things the partner might take an interest in. The partner tend to be less interested in uh, us having a conversation that's very technical and a very unique capability that it's very hard to integrate with a wider offering, unless there's some partners like the kind of the brainy partners are the ones that do consulting, pure consulting. And then you go into rabbit holes about what cloud optimization looks like for in the next five years. So you do blue sky workshops that go on for weeks and a lot of post-its, these sort of things. But there's a different level of partners and is the ones that we tend to engage with very early in the sales cycle, not that much in post-sales. We tend to be on the execution side of things. Uh, so I don't have a problem. We're sharing um, some of our telemetry, but I just found the partners that are not all that interested in it. Sometimes they just want to say, okay, tell me if there's a risk and if there's an opportunity. And if so, point me in the right direction and we go and close it. And it kind of works for me because it frees up time for my team to do the long-term, more relationship-based work that customer success is all about. Yeah, you know, in my experience, I, it's, um, I, I think, Lorenzo, you, you kind of touched on it beautifully from, from the, you know, whatever your, your health mo uh, metrics are, you'll pick the ones you think are relevant. And, and, and from the partner perspective, ones, some of them they don't care about. But I think like, especially at larger companies, there's much more like, don't show anything, you know, be much more guarded. So I think we've been very, in my past, been very, very strategic about what we show I think, and really limited to, to different metrics um, that they, the partner could potentially act on and improve on. At the end of the day, once again, the customer is doing business with you. It's your logo on their screen. If something's not trending right and your partner was responsible for it, you need to get them in the loop. Mm -hmm. You need to help them understand where those uh, where those challenges are. Um, I, I've seen organizations that have uh, that that have embraced partner models uh, when the partner kind of owns everything soup to nuts. Uh, they'll have a partner success manager right? where where it's not a customer success manager; it's a partner success manager who's responsible for uh, um, making sure that the partners are driving success, uh, and that partner success manager. Uh, doesn't necessarily own a portfolio of customers. They own a portfolio of partners who own a portfolio of customers and, and would be exposed to those health metrics and raise the, raise the red flag or act as kind of that go between, between the organization and the partners to notify them of here's what I'm seeing. 
but somebody needs to be watching this thing. You know, we 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 would do it. It was very manual when I was doing it for for that uh, that analytics company, that BI company I mentioned before. Uh, we didn't have any sort of systems. We didn't have a huge partner organization either. So it's a very very manual process. Uh, we we didn't have a huge number of partners. So uh, we were we were using those types of health scores, those types of that, that type of analytics um, to um, not just keep an eye on our customers that our partners had had uh, had um, onboarded, but uh, also as uh, uh, an indicator of how good our partners were doing. And, you know, we keep seeing these types of troubles at this point in the customer journey. And so we need to sit down and have a conversation and either educate your team uh, more or, you know, these expectations were not set appropriately in the sales cycle. So let's sit down and talk about that. How do we get expectations aligned? Uh, you know, we we used a lot of that to to drive continuous improvement with our partners. Mohammed, thanks. The question. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, we're B2B2B. Our sales team has partner relationship managers who own the partnership. So the relationship renewals QBRs and currently CS helps to onboard the clients via these partnerships, but struggling to find our value after that. Is it strange that CS doesn't own the partnerships when we own the full client relation? When we sell direct. When I, when I, if I'm reading this correctly, Andrew, I'm, I'm thinking there is a, there may be a, a some confusion with the alignment of responsibilities here. Yeah. Um, because it's like the partner relationship, the PR, PRP own the renewals relationship and then the sales QBRs. But who owns the value realization for the products and the solutions? Um, yeah, I think there's some overlapping responsibility. And I, the way the the question is written, it it is looks like a, a strange pairing of the two. Um, if I'm reading it right, so B to B to B. So it sounds like it's a it's a solution sold to businesses that that they use that they embed to sell to their customers. So they white label the the solutions to another yeah, customer. That's what that's what I'm reading this. At. They white yeah. label, so you've got. I mean, this is similar to that that BI uh, company I was mentioning. We had a about thirty five percent of our business was white labeling our reporting solution to uh, SaaS companies that didn't want to build their own reporting solution because we had something, right? So they would embed our reporting solution in their offering, whatever that may be, and they would then offer reporting to their customers. If I read this question correctly, I think the key is uh, the, last, um, the last phrase. It's strange that customer success doesn't own the partnership. Uh, and my, my answer would be, no, it's not, uh, at least in my experience. And the reason is that partners might take many forms and shapes, and not all the partnerships are to do with what we call customer success. Sometimes you call partnerships, they are specific to a tender or a bid or a business process. So it doesn't really make sense to lump them all together under customer success. The partners that work in the customer success space are a subset of the partners that your organization will be dealing with. So it kind of makes sense to try and streamline and create a unit that's specific for partners. Uh, in that way, you drive a level of, um, a level of, uh, I suppose, um, consistency across you know, partner commissions, partner enablement, partner training, this sort of thing. So uh, all the organizations have been with, usually the partners were owned by a partner team and we were part of that conversation, but not responsible for. All right, anybody else have anything to add? I don't know what, how much more we can get into this without in that, that we can go down a rabbit hole on this one. Yeah. Somebody needs to be the anchor in that relationship. That's what, that's what I, that's what <laughs> yeah, it boils much. down to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I yeah. think it requires a lot more. Um, yeah, uh, unpacking of this particular situation, a lot more detail than we've got time for. But thank you, anonymous attendee. Hopefully, that gave you some 
some some ideas, some thoughts. Um, Erica, Erica, thanks for the question. Erica, uh, this is directed at you, Cynthia. Uh, it says, uh, Cynthia, you mentioned treating our partners like clients, in a sense, and meeting with them on a regular cadence to maintain alignment. What type of content do you think we should be sharing during these meetings to drive the most value? Oh, that's a, that's a really great question because um, unlike a customer where like, you know, you know how much they dread QBRs and those sort of things, right? Because it's all about us and metrics and things that we care about and adoption and those sort of things. I think it's the opposite with partners. I think that's exactly what we need to, the sort of metrics that we need to be sharing with them to be saying like, you know, here because ultimately we're trying to help them unpack, um, you know, the different, the, the success they've had in their, in their sales and where the, the gaps might be, if it's training, um, you know, the specifics of adoption and those sort of things. So I think the really, um, metrics associated to usage, sales, um, really basic metrics. Uh, again, sort of the opposite, like the same cadences as a, as a client, but the opposite um, because they're they're acting with us in trying to capture and retain business. Yeah, and I think the goal in those meetings and partnership discussions is you're trying to find out what the strategy is to make sure that your joint customer is satisfied uh, with the relationship as a whole. Because at the end of the day, as Andrew stated, is that that's your customer, right? So you want to be able to discuss ways in which you can share tools and share data amongst the partnership. And those are the time, that's information that you want to take to those meetings to be able to maximize the value of that partnership, right? And build your build your meeting agenda around, you know, uh, maximizing their, their partnership to meet the ultimate goal, which is satisfying your customer base. Awesome. It's a good point because yeah. those contacts are always about, about, there's always alignment, right? At the end, right. at the end, you want to align. So yeah, yeah, perfect point. Yeah. Also, one, one, one last thing to add to that is, uh, the, as far as content goes, is, is making sure that they're aware of changes, updates. Mm -hmm. uh, what what yep. are you hearing? Uh, are expectations being set appropriately? There, there's a lot of things that we even deal with, regardless of partners. A lot of some of the challenges that customer success teams face are uh, misset expectations from the the sales cycle for example right same same stuff right, right? we we need to make yeah. sure that these partners are setting the right expectations <laughs> proposing yeah. things that can be done right oh cuz we know when 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 you can't deliver the client is never happy post sale you know like what yeah. we can't do that yeah that's never a great yeah. conversation yeah, that is not a fun conversation, whether it's your sales team or whether it's one of your partners and you got to get on that call and say, yeah, yeah, they might have said that, but it's like, eh. <laughs> the reality is the situation. So, exactly. All right, Erica, thank you. Um, got another anonymous question here. Would love to hear best practices to engage an unengaged partner. I found one of the greatest ways to engage with an unengaged partner is not send them their partner check. <laughs> usually, usually a great way to get them That's to it. Back. Full stop. Full yeah. stop. You got yeah. it. No one, yeah. no one's going to yeah. top that. Right. Yeah. That's, you know, money talks and bullshit walks. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So stop with your bullshit and call me. I that. can't top it. I can't top yeah. that response. Yeah. 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 The, the, the CS version of that would be, <laughs> Uh, just go on, write up your success plan and execute on it. And then the partner wants to come along. Well, good for you. Uh, what we've done a few times, they kind of can be confrontational, I get it, is that we would uh, create a value realization ROI for customers and teach them, you know, this solution is returning 384% of your investment over a 12-month period. And if the customer is hooked on those kind of numbers, sometimes uh, they will go back to the partner and say, well, it looks like this solution is returning this. We've never done the same number for everything else that you bring to the table. How about that? And so the partner is screaming in front of customers and say, oh, uh, how do I measure that? Say, well, see, if you engage with me, I would have told you that's part of our customer success methodology. Actually, we do value realization qualification and we should work on it. Yeah, that yeah I, very much the single best way is, is when there's money involved. Yeah, take the money away. <laughs> the, other, the, the other way, the other way is to learn about and 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 put a plan around partners that are not engaged right <laughs> the red you, kimberly, that's for you kimberly right there there it is there's the red swing line the swing right line. 
Milton swing line. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Eric. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying you, you can learn from a, a, a partner that's not engaged, right? Oh, totally. And just not do the steps that got you to the point where there wasn't engaged, right? Have frequent meetings, show matrix, uh, consistently collaborate, and then you would get a feel when they're not going to be engaged in the long term, right? So just don't do the things that, that got them to not be engaged with you, right? And learn from that to not do those things again. And that comes from collaboration, meetings, planning, thing of that nature. And I'll, uh, of course, take the check away. Well, I also, <laughs> think, I also think that, 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 you know, when you're, people think about partnership agreements and it's all this legalese, but part of it is here are the expectations that we have, right? We have these expectations. We have these expectations of how you're going to work with us. We have these expectations of how you're going to work with our, with, with the customer base. Right. And, 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 and I think you need to lay that out for them. And that's how we always did it. Said, here, here's the type of training we expect you to take. Here's the type of response, the type of SLA we expect when we reach out to you, when your customer, when the customer reaches out to you, right. You, you need to set those expectations with your partners from the get go, just like you set expectations with your customer. Here's what we need from you. Here's what you can expect from us. And when they don't follow through on those expectations, then you call them on that. You hold them accountable. for that. Oh, I agree with definitely holding them accountable. I, but I think another approach too, before we get to that stage would be um, like classic prospecting, you know, take it from an SDR. Like, what do they do? They, they, you know, so you basically maybe reach out about, Hey, here's a new feature that provided others X percentage of sales. Let's have a conversation about because again, back to your money. You're absolutely right. It's the money. If they if there's an opportunity for a, a partner or anyone to 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 you know bring in new deals, they want to know about that. But but yeah, I mean at some point that might not be enough if they're completely disengaged. Um, but I think the money money really is because at the end of the day, it's a business relationship, um, yeah. and they're there to, to make money as well. Exactly. Show me the money. Um. Awesome. Aviv asks, how do you, and just a reminder, we'll go until, we'll go for another 10 minutes. We go until quarter past the hour. Uh, so we'll get through as many of the rest of these questions as possible. Um, Aviv asks, how do you verify partner professional level? What kind of certification testing uh, do you do? Now for, for, for us, we, like I said, we had a pretty intensive uh, one week boot camp. We, we were doing a very, we had a very technical uh, uh, platform it required people to uh, understand data warehousing basics, understand how to write ETL code, how to develop, uh, how to develop uh, reports and dashboards, and we put them through an entire certification class uh, with a test at the end that they had to pass. Uh, and then we, you know, at different levels of of uh, of our partner program, you bronze level, you had to go through the training, and then you had to achieve successful implementations for a certain number of customers at a certain customer SAT level. And then to get to the silver level, you had to go through this next set of training courses that took it to a different, you know, to another level. And you had to have an additional amount of, uh, of, of successful implementations with a customer SAT level. Uh, and, and so that's how we kind of, kind of and, and there would be audits being done by some of the technical folks. So in our case, it was, it was actually kind of, it was, it was complicated, but it was easy for us to do that. Because we had a very technical product, and either you knew it or you didn't know it. Yes, and we measured the technical competency with a system of certifications that our tech folks would measure, and it's very straightforward. What we start, what we started bringing about in terms of uh, non-technical is that we're now giving away badges for partners when they do something special. For example, if they work with the federal government, they get a Fed Ramp badge. That okay. means that they fulfill certain requirements. If they have done a global implementation of certain scope, they get a global implementer badge. If they um, if they have uh, expertise that's specific to a certain industry, they might get the airline badge or something like that. So that when a customer goes on our website, they see the product and then they can start envisaging, okay, how to deliver this product looks like. Have I done business with any of these logos? And this is especially important in my Asian region where again, relationship is really the key. And so, customers will say, well, if I was to buy this vendor, who's going to work with it? 
and that's how we get selected. So it's very important to to have that alignment between us and who's going to do things for the end customer because that can be a make it or break it type of type of conversation. Anybody else have anything to add? Cover it. <clears throat> Gustavo asks, uh, I'm glad to hear that we're handling most of these partnership topics in a way that is aligned to what I'm hearing here. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about adherence to the agreed plans and avoid the yes, we know this, uh, but this is how it's done in this region trap. Um, I, I personally, and, and and Cynthia, I would love to get your, you're you having, the, you, knowing that you, you've you've um, uh, managed uh, LATAM before and, and Lorenzo as well uh, outside of uh, North America. But I would think that you would just adjust your partnership agreement to uh, uh, allow for that sort. Of thing. Yeah, it's it's that's such a relevant question because because it does matter cultural, um, you know, and regional um, aspects, a hundred percent. And I think a lot of times, especially you know, um, like U.S. based companies um, or any company from me, whatever, they have a certain way of working. And when you're going into another another. Um, you know, region and trying to, to, to grow the business there and, and, you know, through a partnership, you have to adjust and, and really do, do your homework, you know, leverage the partners, um, you know, kind of intellectual capital within the space and how business is done hundred percent and set those expectations. And maybe it won't make sense, right? If things are too far out, things that, that trap, that's a, such a great question. It, it might not make sense to do the business because the fact is sometimes, you know, we, we don't, we ignore the red flags. It's gonna still happen. So if shenanigans are part of like the local way business is done, and you want to stay out of shenanigans, then it might not make sense to go into that partnership. But you have to absolutely put that in your agreement. Yeah, actually, boundaries. Mohammed, who asked a question, he and I are going to be doing a, a one of our moments of truth webcast series on the uh, the difference. He, he's based out of the Middle East. Oh How yeah, doing business in different parts of the world, you know, is different than where you're coming from. Hundred percent. Yeah, Lorenzo. What about you? I mean, because I know you, you're all, you're all over um, your region. You know, absolutely. Uh, the reality is that no, with twenty four markets under uh, eight, that's twenty four different ways of doing things. So in general, the way we try and do is that we have a plan, but also not just limiting the plan. We try and explain the why we want to get things done in a certain way. And if you work with a good partner, they will get back to you and say, okay, if this is the why and this is your what you want to get to, you might not be on the right track. There's not a way to deliver that. You really want to get it one certified? Yeah, running a one week English only session will get you nowhere. They will attend because they have to, but they won't get certified or they, you know, they won't care or they would attend and then they will ditch you or whatever. So it's so important for us to understand. I see a lot of value in understanding region by region, market by market, what needs to be done. And so sometimes I do scrap the plan and say, look, forget the plan. The plan is just a tool to an end and the end is this. By 10 months, I need the customer to grow 2x and to have so many users certified and I want to have implemented these four use cases that are just non-negotiable. Teach me how is the best way to get this done in your market. You got the experience, I I got a brief. That's it. Let's work together. And good partners do figure something out. They say, okay, well, you shouldn't talk about this now. It will be non-linear. I got a pro in my mind, it's like, oh, this account is gonna grow, grow, grow. And they tell me, no, no, they would do nothing for 12 months. Because the culture of this organization is that you are doing PLC for 12 months. They want to sniff you around. Be nice to them that are after the first year, then they will come up. And for me, it's like, oh, why are we wasting a full year? It's, like, it's not wasting a full year. <laughs> it's, it's building a relationship. They need to learn about it. They need to know you. Did you invite them to your regional event? Because if you didn't, you're missing something there. Lorenzo, that is so spot on. Well, that's so spot on when you come, when you, when you're used to um, working in a, in a business manner in a certain way and you're like, well, what, what, we're just, we're not going to do that. Well, well, then you're not going to do business there. Because you're right. And, and in regions, especially where it's very relationship based, you got to put in your time. And then they re- feel like you're real and, and then they'll, they'll take you on. So 100%, so spot on. And in this region, a short-term change would take six months. Uh, a more structured one would easily, easily go 18 months. But on the flip side, it's unlikely for a customer to say, I'm churning out without telling you anything. Be always some sort of a courtesy pointing in the direction, oh, this is not exactly what I expect. And if you tune in with the partner and with the business culture, you will get red flags. Hard to report on our CRM of sorts, but you know where things are not going the way they do because people will kind of point you politely in the direction that they're not happy. 
Thanks, Gustavo. Um, I think we got time for this one last question from anonymous attendee. Fourteen. Um, do you provide partners access to your CS tool or require them to invest in their own tool? Partner may be engaged with their vendor on other CS programs. How do you share telemetry, health, et cetera, with partners to help them drive the CS motions? Uh, they're on their own on that one in, in my world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's kind of part of the the partner success role. Yeah. That's kind yeah. of part of the role is uh, – and we've had, I've had, I've, I've had partner success, the actual partner success role, and I've had customer success managers who have owned partners as well. Yeah. They, they weren't titled a partner success manager, uh, but they were, you know, they had a, uh, uh, especially in a growing company with a small partner, they say, okay, hey, listen, you're a senior customer success manager. I'm going to reduce the amount of your customer success book of business, but I also want you to, to look after three partners. Yeah. Uh, of ours, and they would be the ones that would share that. What about you, Cynthia? No, I'm with Eric. They're they're on their own. That that's been my experience. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's a good question, though. Yeah. And Lorenzo, you said you you share you share telemetry, you share information, but you're not uh, yeah. giving them access direct access to you. No, I will give them reports like non like static reports. Now, I wouldn't give them access to portals or internal tools. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we're at, we're at the end of our time that we've got for today. I think it was a great conversation, but it's not what I think. It's what all of you think. So please let us know by posting your feedback on LinkedIn and tagging either myself or my guests or success coaching. I want to thank my guests. Thank you all for spending time uh, with us today and uh, at the beginning of the week for our prep and for the ideas, thoughts, insights, and best practices that you shared. One final note. Uh, great CS leaders know that they don't have all the answers, but they know where to get them. That's why we created this CS Leadership Roundtable to harness the knowledge and experience of the community to help improve everyone. And we hope to see you again at our next event on March 8th, when we'll be talking about building a customer success community. I'm sorry, building a customer community. I say customer success so often. It just, <laughs> every time I say customer, it's yeah, that... followed by success. <laughs> It just goes building, off the talking, talking about building a customer uh, community. So until then, make sure to make space for yourself and your mindset every single day. Have a great rest of your week and month, everybody. See you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank